Could Zaporizhia be the next Chernobyl? With the area under fire and the plant facing power cuts, are we in danger of disaster at Europe's biggest nuclear station? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Zaporizhia. For the Ukrainians staffing the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, there is a clear and present danger in their work. In addition to the shelling just outside the station and Russian soldiers controlling the facility, workers are struggling with persistent anxiety and exhaustion. Now, that has experts worried that any mistakes made at the plant could lead to a radioactive disaster. Just last week, a power outage forced Europe's biggest nuclear power plant to rely in part on backup diesel generators. The International Atomic Energy Agency has been able to visit the facility, and while two IAEA representatives will stay on site, they're not authorized to intervene in what some experts call the world's most imminent nuclear threat. Before we discuss that with our panel, let's take a look at how Zaporizhia got here. After months of negotiations, the International Atomic Energy Agency finally made its way inside the Zaporizhia power plant. But the risk of a nuclear disaster still persists. On Monday, Europe's largest nuclear power plant was disconnected from Ukraine's national grid once again. The IAEA says workers at the plant deliberately cut off the reserve line to extinguish a fire caused by shelling. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky blamed Russia for the attack and warned a radiation disaster was near. The last power transmission line, which connected the station to the energy system of Ukraine, was damaged due to another provocative Russian shelling. Again, this is the second time, due to Russian provocation, that the Zaporizhia station was a step away from radiation catastrophe. The nuclear facility was captured by Russian forces in March, but Ukrainians continue to run the facility, which has taken heavy damage since the conflict broke out. Only one of the six reactors is operational, and it's only powered by a backup line. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi, who had been at the site, says the damage to Zaporizhia is critical. And, and I was able to see uh, myself and, and my team uh, impact holes, um, markings on, on buildings of um, uh, shell. So which means that the physical integrity of the facility uh, has been violated not once, but several, uh, several times. And this is something irrespective of the um, of the kinetic power of whatever you are throwing at the plant is unacceptable in any way under any safety and security criteria. Currently, both sides of the conflict are pointing fingers at each other. Russia blames Ukraine for the fighting in and around the Zaporizhia plant. Despite the presence of the IAEA representatives at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the Kiev regime is continuing provocations aimed at creating a threat of a technological disaster. On 4th September, the Ukrainian forces used a combat drone to target the territory of the nuclear power plant. But in a recent interview with ABC, Zelensky says it's Russia that's facilitating a nuclear conflict through Zaporizhia. You see, they occupied our nuclear station. Six blocks, the biggest in the Europe. It means six Chernobyls. It means the biggest danger in the Europe. So they occupied it. So that is, means that they use nuclear weapon. That is nuclear weapon. Although the experts say a Chernobyl scale leak is unlikely, the situation still poses a huge threat to the region. The most worrying scenario is a power loss to the reactor's cooling system. If that happens, there could be a nuclear meltdown, a situation far more worrying to residents than even the recent shelling. 
Бомба то не страшно. The bomb is not scary. It will explode and everything will be normal. But the power plant, yes, this is the scariest. Kiev has pushed to demilitarize the territory around the nuclear plant. But Moscow has rejected that proposal. Instead, two IAEA observers are now based inside the facility. But they may only be limited to reporting what many fear could be the world's biggest nuclear threat. So how much are Ukrainians and the wider region at risk of a nuclear disaster? And what could at least mitigate the worst case scenario? Well, joining me now to debate that are from London, Paul Ingram. He's a senior research associate at Cambridge University's Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Miles Pomper joins us from Washington. He's a senior fellow at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And completing our panel from Berlin is Ben Aris, the editor-in-chief at BNE IntelliNews. Thanks all so much for being with us. Paul, let me start with you and just assess how serious this actually is and how does having at least two IAEA representatives there on a permanent basis maybe relieve some of your concern? So um, I think it is serious in terms of um, shells uh, landing around the plant, in the plant uh, area. There are parts of the plant that are vulnerable to, uh, to um, damage from these shells, uh, vulnerable uh, that could uh, end in radioactive, some kind of radioactive release with local impact uh, significant, uh, similar to that we saw in Fukushima. Um, it's not a Chernobyl type situation. Uh, having having a couple of IAEA inspectors on site uh, is certainly better than having no one. They will be looking at uh, the damage that uh, the uh, the facility is experiencing, and they'll be able to raise the alarm if there's anything mm. significant as a result. So they have a serious safety uh, dimension as well as uh, being the eyes and ears of the international community on the ground. One of the things we have witnessed over the last few weeks and months is uh, concern over what we don't know as much as what we do know. Mm. Just explain though quickly, uh, you know, the difference then between your comparison with Fukushima in this case rather than Chernobyl. Well, uh, in the Chernobyl situation, we had a rapid um, meltdown of the core and a significant explosion that spread radioactivity over a, a whole continent and uh, had impacts across the whole piece. Uh, in the Fukushima situation, we have much more localized but high-level radioactive radiation uh, in the in the area, uh, requiring significant um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, population movement. Uh, and and indeed, there are parts uh, of Japan that are still un uninhabited mm. uh, as a result of that uh, accident uh, uh, well over a decade ago. But it, just to be clear, in Zaporizhia, those most at risk then are those in the the immediate in area, the vicinity. Really. Yes, right. within ten or twenty kilometers of the plant. Okay, um, Miles. Let me ask you if uh, if you're kind of on the same page there about how serious this is. Yes, <clears throat> yes, I'm very much in agreement with what Paul said. Uh, I'd also like to point out he, he used the uh, Fukushima example. Uh, we could also be looking at the same kind of risk of actually what happened at Fukushima, which was that the external power supply uh, got cut off. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what led to the radiation release there, uh, because th there was no cooling. Um, and that's kind of what we're running here, because we keep having these uh, various uh, external power lines go down. Right now, they're, um, as far as I know, they're still off the grid because of that. And uh, eventually, we could have no power source. and and then you would have the radiation release. Right, I mean, those lines are going down. They're also being cut uh, to kind of force this dependence on these backup generators. Uh, right. what, what do you think is behind that? Um, I know you said, we know Russia is not going to agree to a demilitarized zone, which right. in this case could maybe infer that they have bigger plans for this plant and this area, because you had said Russia may be looking to connect the plant to a grid in occupied Crimea. Is that still what you think they're after? Is this part of a strategy here when it comes to keeping the power supply or not keeping it to Zaporizhia plant? I think that could be one of the ultimate goals. I mean, 
look, it's a military campaign. Mm. And you're, if you're Russia, the Ukrainian population had been getting a lot of its electricity from this plant. So uh, there would be a military logic in denying um, the Ukrainians, I mean, unfortunately, uh, electricity from the facility to demoralize your enemy. Mm. Uh, and so at the very least, they have an incentive for the plan not to be functioning and to power down uh, from a military sense and potentially to power it up again to supply Crimea. But I think it's probably almost more important to deny it to the Ukrainians from their point of view. And I mean, how severe is that denial? This is a huge part of Ukraine's electrical power generation here. Yeah, I think it was about 30 percent of the uh, electricity generation in the country uh, before the war. I mean, currently there's only one reactor uh, at the plant operating. I think there's six total. And um, so there, that's already happened to a certain extent. So, uh, but okay. it could get even worse. And it could, could be seen as a very effective weapon. And that's what many are, are right. accusing Putin of in this case, using electricity, power, and energy supplies as a weapon of war. Exactly. Mm. And, you know, this way they can try to blame it on the Ukrainians so that they're not held responsible, even though it's pretty clear that the shelling is probably coming from the Russians. Okay, let me get to Ben Aris and ask, you know, what, what you see as far as the risks of this and the strategy is concerned. Well, firstly, to say that um, obviously Ukraine is home to Chernobyl, which caused this um, huge disaster. but. The reactor there was an old RBMK uh, reactor, and that technology has been um, removed, and and that that reactor has been taken offline. And these reactors, the one at the uh, Zaporozhye, is uh, the new Russian one, uh, VVER, and it's the most modern one that Russia does. And actually, Russia's nuclear technology is um, currently probably the best and safest in the world. And in terms of the the plant and the reactors being hit. By missiles. I mean, they're designed to withstand uh, a jumbo jet crashing into them. Um, it would take a sustained artillery bombardment of the reactor to break through these 10 meter thick concrete walls. So, we're not actually, the danger here is not that the, the um, reactors get accidentally hit by a stray missile. Um, as I think Miles and Paul both pointed out, the danger is if the, um, the, the BVERs are both water cooled and water moderated. And that if the plant gets cut off from electricity, then the water won't be able to circulate, and then you'll have a melt. Um, and that's really the main danger. And that's actually not that hard to organize in so much as if you cut the power lines um, to, to the generators that, that circulate the water, then you could have a meltdown. But again, talking to the experts, the, the consensus is that it would be a sort of Fukushima kind of uh, scenario that the radiation would be release, but it wouldn't be European-wide. It would be a local problem. And again, you'd have to evacuate and you'd make that bit of Ukraine uninhabited for a while. In terms of the strategy, I absolutely agree. It looks like we're going into a long war now. And long wars are won by industrial production, the ability to produce arms, tanks, bullets. And so taking out one of Ukraine's main uh, power sources that cripples the economy and its ability to arm itself. And um, clearly, this is, is a strategic um, goal of the Russians is to make sure that Ukraine cannot fight on its own and leave it entirely dependent on the West for supplies and arms. In your opinion, I mean, as, as a war strategy here, uh, for as horrific as it may be for the civilians involved, is this a smart move on Russia's behalf? I think it's standard practice, isn't it? I mean, as I say, the, uh, in all wars, you, you bomb the factories as well, and, the, and the power plants. It's one of the first things you do, because if you cripple the economy, then you impede the uh, country's ability to fight back. And uh, this in particular, as everyone said, there's actually four, five nuclear plants, including Chernobyl, uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. And this is the biggest one. Um, and you, you disable a large part of the uh, economy by, right. by turning. And as Paul was saying, I mean, the risk, the immediate risk is really only to the Ukrainians uh, in the area. This wouldn't put, uh, you know, people in Russian territory unnecessarily at risk. Um, but Ben, I, I do have to ask you then about more about the economy. Uh, this kind of is your area of specialization. Is the Russian economy actually struggling uh, to any point? Uh, because it seems that 
Putin and all the efforts to isolate Russia, isolate Putin, don't seem to be panning out the way the West had hoped. The Russian economy, yes, it is somewhat struggling, but somehow it seems to be getting Putin arguably more support from within Russia. There seems to be, from some of the people I've spoken to, an even greater sense of unity, because now that they feel isolated and that the world has turned on them, they feel they have each other more than ever. Indeed. I mean, there's a fortress mentality now amongst the Russians, and Putin successfully uh, persuaded them that Russia's being attacked by the West. And so everyone's rallying around, and the, the sentiment there is to support the war, support Putin, and actually take some hardships. However, um, yes, the sanctions aren't working yet. And the economy is doing much better than expected. At the start of the war, we were predicting anything between a 15 and 30 percent contraction to Russian GDP. And actually, it looks like it's going to come in at around 4 4 percent. That's like half as bad as 2008, uh, the global crisis, and then others since in 2014. However, the and, and you have to say that the that the fuel and energy sanctions that have been attempted have been a spectacular failure in so much as rather than cutting Putin off money, uh, Russia is currently making more money than it's ever made before as a result of the leakage in the sanctions, specifically oil that's caused to China and India. However, the technology bans, the, the sanctions on import of equipment, uh, they are going to basically hobble the economy long term. And it's going to take time for those to work, um, probably a year or two. So Putin actually has a fairly strong economy, which, of course, has been affected for the moment. Um, but as if this war drags on for any length of time, then um, the Russian economy is going to suffer more and more. And uh, actually, there's no way out of stagnation for them in the long term. Miles, I mean, do you think the Russian economy is going to be at risk more in the longer term? Um, but we do have to remember as well that the winter is coming uh, for Europe, and people are already agitated with the price of energy. Would that give, with the seasonal change and the demand for fuel, give Russia perhaps a stronger hand to play, especially on the ground in Ukraine, where they are getting more and more control over the energy supplies to Ukrainians themselves? Uh, it's clearly going to be a difficult winter in Europe, I think. Uh, and it does give, you know, it could potentially give the Russians some leverage. But I also think people in Europe, particularly NATO and the EU, have been very conscious of this. Uh, and they've also been stockpiling uh, gas and oil because of this. So some of the price run up that we've seen, in fact, is because of people preparing for the winter ahead. Uh, I'd also like to say on the sanctions, um, while the overall economy has done reasonably well because of high oil and gas prices, you're clearly seeing an effect on the military uh, from the sanctions because of the in, uh, inability of the Russians uh, to import needed technology. They, they Somehow they had a lot of their weapons were dependent on us, which is kind of a strange situation uh, to begin with. But um, you see them doing things like importing North Korean ammunition. I mean, people don't usually rely, uh, leading militaries don't usually rely on the North Koreans as suppliers or the Iranians for drones. So. Um, they're getting more desperate when it comes to the military sector for because okay. of the sanctions. Uh, let me ask Paul Ingram if you agree there, if there is a sense of desperation, uh, per se, in, within the Russian military. Um, because, well, yeah, you know, if, if you give them, scare them further, they could dig in even harder. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if, if they're, they're feeling that sense of desperation or if it just strengthens their resolve, as it potentially could. Sure. No, I think, I think both... Both dimensions are operating here. Mars is quite right to talk about uh, the um, the hits to military capability, but we only have to look at um, other economies that have um, been sanctioned hard over long periods of time. Uh, the South Africans became uh, world leaders in riot control and military equipment relevant to uh, to low intensity warfare, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you can imagine the Russian military. Uh, industrial complex shifting its emphasis uh, uh, in order to to fill the gaps and fill the holes. Of course, that that has impact, particularly if you're a country like Russia that has been attempting to stay up with the Americans in terms of military technology. I think that will be hit quite hard. But in terms of the ability to fight a ground offensive uh, like the one they see in Ukraine, I, I see 
transition rather than fatal challenge to the military capability of the Russians uh, over the coming months and years. Paul, let me ask you, uh, going back to Zaporizhia and, and, and the situation right now, do you worry about anyone uh, perhaps being alarmist or exaggerating in a way that could backfire? Uh, because we heard back in March just how dangerous uh, the situation was, and Z Zelensky himself said that Russia perpetrated, was perpetrating nuclear terror. Uh, that was months ago, and we're still seeing the situation under control. So do you worry about how, I've used this phrase before, but there could be a boy that cried wolf scenario uh, developing, or are, do you think Zelensky is right on message and this is what should be portrayed, that the danger is as serious as he says? So, so people like Miles and I have been working on the end of the world for several decades, and we're very conscious of the dangers of crying wolf mm. in these sorts of situations. I, I, I was going to say earlier, uh, from some of the earlier comments, that, um, that I think both sides have an incentive here to talk up the problem and the, and the risk. Uh, the Ukrainians definitely have uh, an incentive to talk up the risk, and I think that Zelensky has been doing that uh, and making deliberate references to Chernobyl for some time. It's a very effective way of drawing the Europeans into supporting the Ukrainians or shoring up support for them and military transfers. The Russians also have an incentive to talk up this challenge because they have the, the story that they are defending the the power plant from attacks by terrorists and right-wing groups and the like. And that those who care to listen to the Russian story, uh, a narrative here, here, uh, here uh, uh, about a military that is that is defending uh, the uh, this part of Europe against against a nuclear catastrophe. Mm. Um, so I, I do think we have to be careful. It's why uh, I think it's important for us to emphasize the limits of the dangers, but the dangers are definitely there and they are significant. Uh, I, and uh, um, yes, go ahead. I, I was going <coughs> to jump in and say, look, part of this story is that Putin's playing mind games with the West and that he's stoking fears of an energy crisis. And, you know, here we have a nuclear crisis, um, but the same with the gas supplies to Europe. Actually, the storage tanks are full of ahead of schedule, a month ahead of schedule, and there's plenty of gas. We're at the normal place we would be, yet the prices are 10 times higher because uh, the threat of Russia cutting off the gas. And in the same way, this is uh, the, with Zaporizhna, is that there's the threats of a nuclear disaster, which actually, I think, as both Paul and Mars have said, somewhat overblown. I mean, it wouldn't be such a disaster. But Putin's uh, on purpose stoking these fears. He wants to keep prices elevated cause economic harm to us in the West, which is working quite effectively. But um, as, as Paul was just saying, um, you know, there's a vested interest from both sides, Ukrainian and Russia, to talk this up because Ukraine is desperate for support. It doesn't have any industry working at all now, and it's entirely dependent on the West for aid, and it's terrified of the West getting bored of this conflict going away. Miles, let me ask you, I mean, do you think this is effective, or, or could this backfire, this talking up? on both sides, really, but, but particularly with Ukraine. The other dimension I would add is that the, not just for their own public, but the Russians have an incentive to talk up the problem because if their goal is to essentially shut down the reactor, which they've, they've or the plant, I should say, several reactors, um, the, the sort of safest things you could do is to power down all the reactors. Uh, and so this gives them an excuse to do that. Uh, and I think that's a lot of the psychology here. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you then, I mean, what what do you think could potentially de-escalate this Zaporizhia scenario right now? What kind of mediation could help, if any? I don't well, think I mean, uh, go ahead, Miles. Ben, okay. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, you know, obviously the ins having the inspectors in there is is useful to have objective observers uh, who can you know, tell the story to the world about what's actually happening and get past the propaganda of both sides. Uh, but I think, you know, what you need is some sort of perimeter around the plant that's demilitarized. I think that's pretty evident. The Russians just don't want it. Uh, ideally, you'd have UN peacekeepers in there, uh, some force like that that would, you know, could mm. uh, keep the militaries out. Ben, uh, your, your sentiments there? 
Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything you can do. I mean, this is just another point of pressure that Putin's operating, like the gas, like the grain. And um, they're all designed to bring the West to the negotiating table and to take off the sanctions. And so he's creating himself leverage in that conversation to saying, right, you know, we'll take our troops out of the nuclear power plant if you give us something. Uh, and of course, nobody's in the mood to negotiate with Putin or offer any concessions, particularly not the Ukrainians. So it's a stalemate. I, I think the Russians will stay there as long as, you know, the war continues um, and uh, the West is going to maybe at some point offer some sort of concession. But I think it's unlikely. You will have to have the final word. Uh, I'd like to thank all three of my panelists really so much for being with us on this edition of The Newsmakers. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.